Town Hall and the American Broadcasting Company present America's Town Meeting of the Air. Town Meeting tonight! Town Meeting tonight from Dallas, Texas. Should we accept the new fashions for women? Hair designer Sarah Benenson of New York, Adrian of Hollywood, fashion editor Lois Long, and movie star Constance Bennett. Here both sides on... Everybody listen. The city of Dallas is proud to welcome the first origination in the state of Texas of the nation's most popular radio forum, America's Town Meeting of the Air. Station WFAA and a special town meeting host committee, headed by Mr. Elmer Scott and other officers of the Dallas Civic Federation, are the hosts for tonight's meeting here in McFarland Memorial Auditorium on the campus of Southern Methodist University. Deep in the heart of Texas, Dallas is one of the most progressive cities in the South. It's one of the most important business centers in the South and is extremely style conscious. The citizens of Dallas, like all Texans, are proud of their beautiful women, and they see to it that their women are well-dressed. Dallas is, therefore, an extremely appropriate place for tonight's town meeting to originate. This city is agog with discussions about the new look, the length and style of women's skirts, whether there should be pads in shoulders or hips, and whether to buy or not to buy. Here to preside over our discussion is our moderator, the president of Town Hall, New York, and founder of America's Town Meeting of the Air, Mr. George B. Denny, Jr. Mr. Denny. Good evening, neighbors. Your town meeting is interested in this subject because what women wear costs more than $11 billion annually and constitutes the third largest industry in the country. We're also interested because you, our listeners, are trying to make up your minds about whether you'll accept the new fashions in whole, in part, or not at all. It was here in Dallas that a revolt against the new look was started. But it was also in a leading department store here in Dallas, Neiman Marcus, that recently made an award to Christian Dorr for outstanding service to the clothing industry. And Monsieur Dorr is one of the French designers chiefly responsible for the creation of the new look. But the revolution is not confined to Dorr, but to 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 Dallas, as it has become front page news all over the country. And nearly every American family is furiously engaged in discussing the new fashions for women. One of the principal supporters of the new fashions, although she has her own ideas about how they should be adapted to American needs, is Fear Benenson, American designer for Bonwit Keller in New York City. The most outstanding spokesman on the other side is Adrian of Hollywood, creator of the padded shoulder and the slim hip line. We are fortunate in having both of these celebrated designers with us here tonight. But as this battle is not confined to designers alone, we also have the well-known fashion editor of the New Yorker magazine, Miss Lois Long, who supports Miss Benenson's views, and the celebrated star of screen and radio, Miss Constance Bennett, who's been voted among the best-dressed women of America for several years. So let's hear first what the authorities think. First, from the highly successful Phil Benenson of Bonwit Keller, New York, who ranks as one of America's top designers, Miss Benenson. Mr. Daddy, I can't... You can't imagine how pleased I am that we are discussing this subject on America's town meeting of the air. Because of this controversy over fashion, the greatest ambition of every woman is fulfilled. The men at last are interested and are noticing as never before what we women wear. To me, the question is purely academic. The new fashions are here, and they are here to stay until the time comes when they inevitably change again. It is only a question of time when every woman will accept the new trends. Today, thousands of women are already wearing the new styles, and every woman is so completely aware of them that when she greets an acquaintance, her eyes automatically sweep the other woman's hemline before the familiar darling, her are you? Dressmakers are absolutely buried under discarded shoulder pads and skirts to be made longer. I'm often asked, can the fashion be forced on women? Can the fashion magazines dictate what women will wear? Or is it maybe a conspiracy of designing merchants? 
Don't you for a minute believe it. When a new style catches on, as this one has, it is because the women themselves are ready for it. They are tired of the way they look in their old clothes. The new fashions look wonderful to them, and they want them. Once started, no one can stop them any more than one can stop a tide. Plastic fashion changes have always occurred just before or after the war, because fashion mirrors its own time. The Napoleonic War, the Civil War, the First World War, each carried in its wake a fashion revolution. Just before the last war, women began to take on many of men's responsibilities, and she carried them through the war. Psychologically, it helped to have big, strong-looking, masculine shoulders superimposed upon her own slender ones, and she accepted short skirts and a military look for this reason. Now the war is over, the men are home, and women want to be as alluring and feminine as possible. How does a man feel putting his arms around a woman whose shoulders are like a football player's? The change in clothes would have come gradually if government restrictions had not frozen the silhouette into something that looked like a short, narrow tube with a box top. Without those restrictions, the present fashions would have evolved quite gradually, minus all the shoe and fire. <clears throat> the very fact that the subject is a matter of debate tonight is significant. If it were an unacceptable fashion, it would not have provoked even a telephone conversation. It would have died at birth. It is natural that the change in style needs a moment to find its footing. But I have full confidence in American woman's discrimination and good taste. She will maintain a proper balance. Do you remember protests after the First World War and how people thought women are going to perdition because of their short skirts and the fact that they bobbed their hair? Can we be in danger again? Are we headed for ruin because our skirts are coming down? Critics of the new fashion say its influence is continental. What is wrong with that? Must we accept the short, narrow skirt and the bulky shoulder as the American national costume? If American fashions were not sensitive to influence, we might still be wearing the pilgrim's clothes. Since the days of the Crusaders, people have adopted ideas from other countries to enrich their homes, their literature, and their clothes. For example, California has influenced the sports clothes of Europe, and in turn, the South Seas has influenced California. There is no place for isolationism in fashion. Ideas and styles know no boundaries. Is it wise, in the light of economic conditions, to make these changes? Is it ever unwise to stimulate an industry particularly the third largest industry in the country. Millions of people are employed by it, and they in turn feed the circulation of money and encourage prosperity. Of course the new dresses are expensive, but not because they are new styles. Everything we buy has gone up in price, and clothing is no exception. But the increase in price is no greater in the clothing field than in any other. The new styles are a challenge to the American woman imagination and ingenuity to bring her clothes up to date, and that can be done without great expense. She can lengthen her hemline, pull in her waist, and resort to many tricks to look fashionable. To me, this is a beautiful fashion. It's exciting and romantic, and only those who like to live in the past would ever attempt to stop it. Thank you, sir, Benenson. Now let's hear the other side of the case from a man who's helped to set fashions for women both on and off the screen, Gilbert Adrian of Hollywood. Mr. Adrian. <laughs> Miss Benenson, I couldn't disagree with you more completely. I do not think American women should accept the new fashion, which is the sloping shoulder, the corseted waist, the padded hip, and the very bulky long skirt for daytime wear. This is the silhouette from France, which has been introduced as the news of the moment. This is the fashion that American women are rebelling against, 
And it is the fashion that I think is completely unbecoming and extremely impractical in the daytime for most women. In my whole argument, I speak entirely of daytime wear. Women have fought in recent years to have bodily freedom, to be released from all hampering eccentricities. Skirts that were too long, corsets, buckles, hoop skirts, hobble skirts, all these daytime fashions have disappeared. Magazines devote pages to health and encourage women to build beautiful bodies. And yet today, in this year of 1947, they are suddenly told to wear a corset, that a wasp waist is divine, that a padded hip is wonderful, and skirts are heading south at a great rate. Will someone please tell me what it all adds up to? If it's to sell new clothes and make you throw away your old ones, then I have no use for it. If, 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 you, if you will analyze the present French look, you will quickly see that in order to attempt to regain their fashion prestige, they've had to take a completely opposite stand from the American look on every point. We have shoulder pads... We have shoulder pads, they remove them. We have a natural waist, they say corset it. We have slim-looking hips, they say pad them. We have a trim, graceful length skirt, they say bulge it and drop it to the ankles. And our fashion magazine swallowed it hook, line, and sinker. And so did some of our designers. <laughs> Paris advocates skirts to the ankles. American women will never accept a fashion that gives them a droopy look, a bulgy look, a fat look, and very few women over 30 can cope with this look, even if the fashion is stamped Paris in 18 karat gold. <laughs> this silhouette was created purely and simply to counteract the independence of American fashion thinking, and it's not good enough to do it. The American women never looked better as a whole than she did during the war when we designed clothes that suited her life. She had an uncluttered look. She was given stimulating new things. It seems a pity to me that we American designers, with no yardage limitation or restriction to cope with, should feel the need now of rushing to copy and adapt the first ridiculous brainwave that reaches our shores. <laughs> Most most designers lengthen the skirts to a very graceful length immediately after L-85 war restrictions were lifted. I think that they never need be longer than they are at the moment. The middle of the cap is long enough and some can be a bit shorter. <clears throat> in, the, in the evening, I think women can always go all out for whatever they like, whether it be buckles, crinolines, ankle length, evening clothes, or trains. Let's take a bird's eye view, a very quick one, of the fashion impulse in this country since it began. When first people landed here, they were too busy building log cabins and finding food to worry very much about new fashions. As their towns grew and they gained more security, they also had more time to find out what their friends at home and in Europe were in England and Europe were wearing. France dictated most of the fashions then and for many years continued to do so magnificently. As our country became a wealthy country, we continued to ask, what are they wearing abroad? Fashion magazines came into being and told us. It was not really until the motion picture was born and developed a long time that the hold of France on the fashion world was slightly torn loose. The motion picture did not do fashionable clothes. They were always at odds with fashion magazines. They could not give too much attention to what was being worn at the moment because their pictures came out many months later, and the heroine could not be dressed in something that would probably be out of fashion by the time it was seen a half year later. So fashions were designed just for the screen, and an American type was born who had no relation to the so-called chic mode. This American type reached the world. It even reached the fashion magazines, and in spite of them, as well as because of them, the American look was born. Now we'll jump to the last war. We were cut off from what had been a past fashion source, and were forced to show our hands. American designers came through magnificently. They did a wonderful job with every kind of fashion handicap. Difficulty in getting materials, restrictions, and everything else possible. The war ended. Off to Paris went the little boats and on them went the editors of magazines, designers, and buyers to see what was to be seen. Back they all came with a discouraging picture of bulky clothes m made, the French designers said, to anger the Germans. <laughs> that, that we understood and felt sorry about and were sympathetic. But when suddenly, months later, someone had a brainstorm and nostalgia for a silhouette completely unsuited to our present living, we were gradually not only flooded with pictures of these ungainly creations, but were encouraged to look like them. Why is it necessary to look like a French woman to be chic? Once it was the only way to look. Now it is only one way to look, and not a must. What Paris says is only important if Paris says something important. 
But when Paris hands out the ridiculous silhouette, must we be foolish enough to accept it? I do not like the extremely exaggerated padded shoulder that has evolved from the shoulder I have used. I know I am responsible for a great deal of it. But when people began to feel that a little was good, a lot was better, I felt it was time to stop. The, the shoulders I sponsor today are trim and square, but not exaggerated. But they do have pads, simply because most women are not lucky enough to have perfect figures. They need some help. A slightly padded shoulder makes their waist slender and their hips balanced if they have too much, and too many women have too much. <laughs> if you lengthen the skirt to your ankle, you'll look new all right, but you'd better get a Stanley steamer to go with it and put your husband in a three-inch starched collar. It's all equally quaint and just as uncomfortable. We're living in a day and age that is so active it is constantly becoming more complicated. Try and picture one of our gals driving her car with a long skirt caught in the clutch. <laughs> Any fashion which hinders us or makes us uncomfortable or causes men and women to rebel against it is unnecessary. The evolution of fashion has not always made sense, but thank heavens we can still choose what we like. Our job as designers is to suggest. In the past, women had to follow fashion dictates like lambs led to slaughter. Be glad today that you have freedom of choice, see that you keep it, and don't be bullied. Thank you, Adrian. Now may we hear from the fashion editor, Lois Long, who reports the trends in fashions from the lady for the New Yorker, which is read coast to coast. Miss Lois Long. Mr. Adrian, why you, of all people, are in such a panic. You scream about a return to the Stanley steamer like one possessed. But like most of the critics of the changing fashion today, you apparently haven't seen the new fashion. You're so upset by the freakish stuff in the papers that you haven't had time to notice that American women are already wearing a smaller waistline, which makes the hips and bosom look more rounded without any corset or padding necessary whatsoever. They have skirts that swing out easily to mid calf for daytime. And natural shoulders, padded a bit when padding is needed. Like everyone else, you've been so upset and irritated by the strange and wild exaggerations that you haven't noticed their new line is already here. The extremes of fashion naturally attract most of the attention. It's also very natural that extremes should exist at this time. OPA had our woman in an oblong box, as far as silhouette was concerned. Once these laws were relaxed, liberty became licensed, and everyone went haywire. Everybody knew that American women were restless and ready for a change. What they didn't know was which way the cats would jump. So they tried a bit of everything. Now, you've all seen college shop fashion stalking down the street. low heel shoes, full clumsy skirts flapping around the ankles. But since when have schoolgirls been fashion leaders? Then there is Paris fighting to gain back her old prestige as fashion dictator of the world, which she was until the last war. Some of the atrocities she is showing in her efforts to recapture the American market indicate that she's in a greater panic than anybody. Formerly, our designers and manufacturers were content to adapt and modify the ideas of Paris. During the war, we developed creative talents of our own because we had to. More important, we developed confidence in ourselves and in our taste. Paris can't dictate to us now, Mr. Adrian, and I think she knows it. That's why she's acting so ugly occasionally. She must compete on even terms with us, which is the way it should be. I see your claim that fashion magazines are aiding and abetting Paris in their attempts to cram bad fashions down our throats. And some of the fashions are so bad, I can't believe it myself. Fashion magazines aren't interested in whether a fashion is good or bad. They're interested in fashion news. And, as in other types of news, the eccentric gets the headlines. And there are many violent shrieks that the new fashions won't do for American women because she's athletic. But women athletes don't wear Adrian suits on a tennis court. They don't put on a black crepe dress by Miss Benenson to go swimming. Active sports have their own requirements and their own rules for dress. So does a strictly tailored suit, which is one kind of a uniform that I think women will never relinquish. But in other fields, I can't understand the criticism that the new fashions are terrible for American women who work in offices or lead an active life. The new fashions are far less confining for this purpose than the ones we have had before. Easy skirts and easy shoulders mean easy movement for busy women. There's been much... 
There has been much to do also about what Mr. Adrian calls the American look. By this, he apparently means broad, padded shoulders with a narrow line down the hip. My experience is that most women, American or not, aren't built that way. If anyone insists on bringing nature into all this. To get a narrow hip look, most of the women I know had to compress themselves into a girdle which pushed a heavy roll up around the waistline. Very attractive. But Adrian here, who tried to compress hips in this fashion, is alarmed about a small pinching at the waist. Usually a little thing with no bones about it at all. I love it. The whole fashion emphasizes some portion of the body. I like the shift toward a small waistline. We can't compete with men who have brawny shoulders and narrow hips are concerned. Why not victimize them instead by emphasizing the things that we do have? Waistline, bosom, and hips. As for the accusation that designers and manufacturers are trying to put over new fashions solely so that women will throw everything away in their closets, this is a lunatic charge. I have a dress and done some for me over two years ago. It has natural shoulders, knit waist, a longish flaring jacket, a bell skirt. When the tail around the corner has a moment, he'll put a two-inch fold around the hemline, and I'll continue to have a new look in it for another three years. But the really good fashions don't arrive all of a sudden, or depart all of a sudden. But neither do they remain static. And when you want to replace a dress in your wardrobe, you don't want to maintain a status quo. You want to lift. For these reasons, I say down with unnatural shoulders that give women a neckline like, like a turtle. Down with girls that shove you into a fatty roll around the waistline. I am for lower skirt lines and smooth shoulders and graceful movement in my clothes. In short, I am in favor of women looking less like executives and more like women. Thank you, Lois Long. Glamorous Constance Bennett, star of screen and radio, has a flair for fashion, which has won for her the title of Best Dressed Woman many years. We're grateful to Allied Artists for allowing Miss Bennett to leave her picture, Smart Woman, which she's making in Hollywood, to fly to Dallas for this program. And now may we hear from Constance Bennett, who, needless to say, is wearing an Adrian gown. that I wholeheartedly agree with Adrian is an understatement. To say that I wholeheartedly disagree with Miss Benenson is still a greater understatement. I've come a long way to put in my two cents worth, so here goes. Miss Benenson said that people who didn't accept this so-called new silhouette were people who wanted to live in the past. Well, I say that if they do accept it, they are living in the past. <laughs> because it's a fashion of the past and one of the most hideous fashions of the past. The world has progressed, science, education, and industry. I'm sorry we can't say the same thing about some fashion designers. What if airplanes went back to the days of the Wright brothers, medical science to the days of the medicine man, and women returned to the days of elbow grease and washboards? It would be pretty gruesome, wouldn't it? And that's exactly the word I think describes the new silhouette. Gruesome. We've reached a sad state of affairs when designers don't use their creative ability and go ahead instead of averting to the ugliest period of the past. I, for one, am not going to let a few headline-seeking designers, fashion magazines, and store windows intimidate me into wearing what they say is the latest style from Paris. Not on your life. I hope that the majority of American women will be loyal to America and some of the truly fine designers we have over here and not be ballyhooed into accepting the dowdy silhouette that Paris is trying to foist on us. I think it's about time that some of our fashion recorders get on the bandwagon and play an American tune as loudly and as well as they play some of the French ones. They played fine American fashion tunes during the war. Let's hope that now that the war's over, we're not pushed back into a secondary place just because some people think that it's chic to accept anything from Paris. Miss Long said that fashion magazines were instruments used to suggest styles, but at the rate they're ballyhooing that so-called new look from Paris, I think they're doing more than suggest. I think they're dictating. I go along with Miss Benison in her belief that every woman wants to be as alluring as possible, but I challenge her thinking when she states that this 
new silhouette will win out because it is fresh and exciting. I believe that any style must be helpful to the woman wearing it. And I can't see where a body shackled by a corset, restricted by a hobble skirt or a skirt too long for freedom of motion, topped by drooping shoulders, does anything except encourage doubtiness. And there's nothing exciting about doubtiness. Miss Benison, in summing up her statements, asks us whether the slender shoulders look old, whether the long, full skirts look old. The question has never been one of age, but of beauty and symmetry of line. It's too bad that short skirts were abused by some who wore them too short, but that's no reason for us to go to the other extreme and practically cover up the ankle bones. Adrian pointed out, and I agree with him, a street skirt is most graceful when it comes to about the middle of your calf or even a little shorter. Miss Long apparently agrees with us, in spite of the fact that she claims to be on the other side of the fence about the points in question. Nowhere in the world will you find women more beautiful than in America. Nowhere in the world will you find women with the innate knack for wearing clothes than you do in America. Who knows the American woman better than the American designer? He'd never offend femininity by creating such a clumsy silhouette as Paris is now offering us. Ms. Benison stated that she thought the new styles were a challenge to our imagination and ingenuity. What imagination? What ingenuity? They're the very same horrors that we, thank heaven, have grown away from. Why go back to them? Why go backward in dress in a forward-moving world? That would cancel out all the stride American fashion has made. I, for one, am not going to worry about silly fads and so-called revolutionary changes. I am wearing suits that Adrian created two years ago, and I intend to go on wearing them. Good lines are ageless. I'm going to wear what becomes me most for daytime, square trim shoulders, skirts to the middle of my calf, a natural waist and hip line. I believe that all women would be much happier in an accepted fashion that suits her than in a new fashion that doesn't. Choose what's most becoming. <laughs> Choose what's most becoming to your face, your figure, and your life. And you'll be well-dressed in chic. Don't be finagled into wearing clothes that make you look dowdy, frumpish, and awkward just because some fashion designers, manufacturers, and magazines tell you that this new look is what is being worn this season and that you should discard your old wardrobe and spend money that you could use to better advantage elsewhere. Thank you, Connie Bennett. Now, will all three of you ladies and uh, Adrian join me up here around the microphone while we have our discussion. Uh, before we let the audience in on this, Miss Benenson, how about a word from you? You've uh, been the object of a few remarks here by Adrian and Miss Bennett. Uh, how about standing up there and scrapping back? Well, I'm against Mr. Adrian and Miss Bennett because they want the status quo. And... I don't like the status quo. When we can change, we should change. We should wear clothes that are becoming to us. I've never said we shouldn't. I like skirts that are wider. I do a lot of walking, and I like my skirts wider. I don't like them too short because I have ugly knees. And I'm sure that many of you have the same thing. That's why I don't agree with Miss Bennett. And the same. Uh, uh, uh. Uh, Mr. Adrian, have you a comment at this time? No, but I'd like to direct something at Miss Long. What have I done now? <laughs> she seems to be... She feels I've been tearing my hair about fashion because we... I haven't seen the new fashion. But I, uh, I know that she has because she's reviewed them in her column and as, as uh, late as last week, I can't quite figure out which side of the fence she's on. And if Mr. Denny would give me one minute, not even a minute, a half a minute, to read a quote from Miss Long... In last week's New Yorker, I'd like to see if she can tell me where she is in this picture. Miss Long, will you give him permission to quote? Certainly. All right. You have my Mrs. permission and Miss Long. This is from Miss Long's column. One minute you may encounter this season is the tight bodice with a widely flaring peplum, either padded or pleated over a skirt that is full from the waistband down. A concoction like this may be fine for skinny kids, but it makes women who have reached some degree of maturity look squat and matronly. Right. Then she goes on. Good dressmaking means slimness over the hips. Well, that's what we're fighting for. And a jutting peplum requires narrowness below it. You will also, I fear, see some offerings with narrow shoulders, easy-fitting jacket, and a long circular skirt 
and intended for daytime wear, mind you. A mannequin who pranced out at one of the showings looked like a pyramid on the loose. Now, which side are you on? Mr. Brown, you want to step up? Nobody who cares about fashion at all, and that goes for all of us, like wild extremes in any way. We all agreed, I think, that mid-calf is a good length for daytime. Miss Benson and I are both in favor of that, as, but we like the fuller motion. As for that piece that he picked up about the jutting peplum, the peplums, I mean, are those very, very heavy ones. Stick out from the hip and have a lot of fullness below that. There are plenty of peplums that are graceful. <laughs> plenty of peplums that are graceful but indicate a line below. And it's so. Oh, yeah. If the very fashion that she spoke of is disliking that thick, heavy peplum is the fashion that is trying to be foisted on us, because I saw the Christian Gale collection, and it is horrible. No, no, no. Uh, I don't understand why you're so excited about the French fashions. Nobody is making you wear them. We are American designers, and we are making American fashions. I wish you would make American fashions and not adapt the horrible French fashions that are being foisted on us. I'm sorry, Mr. Benenson. Mr. Adrian has adapted fashions in his life, Chinese influence, Indian influence. We all take what we can get the best from this world. We forget the atomic bomb. We never, we even took German scientists to come over here. Why not? Why not take what there is best and what you like best in the world? The world is ours. It's the one world. With everybody preaches this to us. If the French do something good, I want the French style. If the Americans do good, I want American style. All right. Thank you, Miss Benenson. Now, Mr. Adrian was right at her shoulder there. I agree. If the French do something good, we've always been very gracious about it. We've never gotten angry about anything until they did something bad. And this is something bad, and they ought to take it on the chin. But... The thing that I'd like to, to just ask a moment is I, I saw uh, something that is more frightening than anything we've discussed so far. On the cover of uh, a woman's wear magazine, which is a daily fashion paper in New York, I saw this. Now, you try and you visualize this as I talk about it. It's very simple and it's well titled. This is a new French fashion which is appearing called the beehive. Now, if you will imagine a beehive, there was a woman's head on the top of the beehive and two feet coming out of the bottom. This was exactly what the picture looked like. It is what we are supposed to adapt and make practical. Now, why do we have to take ugly fashions and make them so we can wear them? Why don't we just start out with good ones? Thank you. Now, Miss Long. I, would, I, I agree that atrocities are atrocities, and we shouldn't accept them at all. Well, dressed people never accept them, and well, they accept very extreme things. But Paris has a complete monopoly on some of these horrible styles. There are some very bad ones coming from us, too. We ought to have to watch them all. Well, for the sake of clarity, uh, Miss Benenson, suppose you tell us just what it is about these new styles that you do like, as opposed to what you don't like, if you could, in a sentence or two. I like the normal shoulder. I don't like too heavy a padding. I like the widest curve around 13 inches off the floor. I like the small waistline. Uh, uh, all right, I was going to ask Mr. Adrian the same question. Of, is there anything about the Paris styles that you like? Well, I haven't seen very much about in the Paris fashions that I like because the ones that have been shown in the magazine have been very, very ugly, and I think that is the reason that not only I have been rebellious about it, but so have 90% of the women, or we wouldn't be here tonight. All right, thank you. Now, some of these women are out here in the audience. They want to ask you questions. And while, uh, our list, while we get ready for this period, I'm sure that our listeners will be interested in the following message. But first, let's pause for station identification. WJZ, New York. Key station of the American Broadcasting Company.
Yes, friends, you're listening to the nation's most popular radio forum, America's Town Meeting of the Air, originating in McFarland Memorial Auditorium in Dallas, Texas, where we're the guest of a special host committee and station WFAA. We're discussing the question, should we follow the new fashions for women? We're about to begin our question period when Fira Benenson, Adrian, Lois Long, and Constance Bennett will answer questions put to them by this representative audience. Many of you are listening tonight in groups in New York, Hollywood, Seattle, Denver, Chicago, Atlanta, and in smaller towns and cities throughout the country. At the close of our program, you'll carry on your own discussions of this exciting and very important question. Why not make it a habit and have your own town meeting discussion group in your home, club, school, or church every Tuesday night? Remember, Tuesday night is town meeting night. For your convenience, copies of tonight's broadcast including the questions and answers to follow, will be printed in our town meeting bulletin, which you may secure by sending 10 cents to Town Hall, New York 18, New York, to cover the cost of printing and mailing. We're also very happy to announce that in tomorrow's issue of the nationally circulated New York Herald Tribune, you'll find a four-column summary of tonight's town meeting, including the questions and answers to follow. The Herald Tribune does this each week as a public service to a better-informed America. And now for our question period, we return you to Mr. Denny. The person who wins tonight's Encyclopedia Americana will have to ask a very good question. For our local committee of judges will award this set to the question it considers best for bringing out facts and broadening the scope of this discussion. The winner will be announced on next week's town meeting at this point in the program. Last week, when we discussed high prices, our question... The winning question was, as an industrialist, aren't you afraid that since high prices usually mean high profits, that lower prices will mean lower profits for you? That question was asked by G.G. Eisenhower of Albuquerque. Now, we begin with the lady over here and the uh, purple hat, is it? Um, my question is for Miss Long. My name is Alice Richardson, housewife and ex-secretary. Uh, with the continued shortage of clothes prevailing in Europe, should we use so much more material to provide new wardrobes for ourselves now? That is a very awkward question. I uh, very tenderly don't know how to answer it. All right. Thank you. You just uh, don't know how to answer it, and that's that. That's a very frank and honest way to put it. Any, any of you like to handle that question? Any of you other speakers up here on the platform? Uh, no, nobody wants to jump up and take that hot one. Uh, Miss Benson? Oh, very good. Fine. Thank you. Well, Mr. Adrian says he wants the status quo only for the daytime. In the evening, he allows as much material as can be used. Therefore, there is no quarrel between us on materials. Now, if your clothes are to be discarded, send it to Europe. Don't put it in North Pole. Right. I'm afraid we haven't quite answered the lady's question, though, Miss Benetton, as to whether we should... Uh... Go ahead with these new styles that take so much more material when uh, that material may be needed to spread around the world, as I understand the implication of her question. What? Uh, Ms. Long says that uh, if we were sure it would be. Well, it looks like we're not going to get a direct answer to that question, so uh, we'll consider that all four of the speakers have dodged it, and let's uh, have another question. The young lady right here on the aisle, uh, yes? I'm Margaret Poulter, and I'm a student in high school. I would like to state my question to Ms. Long. Well, you have uh, two fingers, meaning a question for Adrian. Now, is your question for Miss Long or Adrian? Miss Long. Well, I'll take one for Adrian. Who has one for Adrian? I've just had one for Miss Long. All right, the lady over here. Now, please hold up the right number of fingers for the person to whom your question is directed. One finger for the first speaker, two for the second, three for the third, four for the fourth. All right? Well, and Adrian. speak in that direction. Um, Mrs. Corinne Hoskins, Dallas, uh, don't you think that by making a national issue out of merely changing styles in women's clothes, we must look silly to other countries? Mr. Edwin, I think we probably do, but that isn't the point. The thing is that the national issue is here, which I didn't raise. It was raised by all of you ladies, so I've just come here to help you along. Where is that man over there on the aisle that had a question? Uh, Miss Bennett. You want my name? Miss Bennett? Miss Benenson. Bennett or Benenson? Benenson. Miss Benenson. Miss Benenson, do you not feel that the change in fashion 
is the first overt expression of a change in social philosophy of the people of this country and of the world, a desire to return to a more normal, a more moral, a more socially acceptable, and a more conventional way of living that has made the, this country great and famous throughout the years. Sounds like a lawyer. I didn't say that. Right? Uh, we're going to give that gentleman a chance to make it a little clearer. Uh, uh, he can probably uh, tell me that I've misunderstood it. If I understand his question, he thinks that the new styles are more moral, more uh, mature, uh, more American than uh, they have been before. Is that right? Well, more this. I believe that the change, or the desire for change, is the desire to change not only in fashion, but in everything else. And fashion is the first manifestation of that change, or that desire to change, is something more sensible. I agree with you completely. <laughs> Women want to look like women and not like military men today. Mr. Adrian, have you anything to say to that? Miss uh, Bennett? Yes. Miss Bennett. All right. I don't see anything the matter with the morals or anything else about America that the fashion should be the first start to want to change anything in America. Right, the uh, lady there. I'm Margaret Malone, and I'd like to ask Miss Bennett this question. Ninety percent of the women in this audience and all over the country have large hips. What's wrong with a style that makes large hips less objectionable? Nothing is wrong with a style that makes large hips less objectionable. I don't think the padded hips do, do you? I would not have on our feet, Miss Long. Uh, Miss Bennett has twisted a great many things in the course of this evening. One is that nothing makes big hips look smaller, better than the princess line through the waist. No belt and an easy curving line through the waist and out over the hip. And the best of the new fashions, the most conservative of the new fashions, have exactly that line. A smallness on the waistline and an easy line following out. And out to a full hem. Thank you, Mr. Adrian. Mr. Adrian, you got a comment? I think if women want to wear this new fashion and have their hips look as large as possible... They should be allowed to do it, but I don't think that they should try to stop women who don't want the hips as large as possible to wear it. Thank you. Check the lady right here, please, with the pink flower in a hat, yes? Good curly housewife. Why not accept... Miss Bennett. Miss Bennett. Why not accept these in our own way? Lengthening skirts, following hands, using bands, yokes, wide belts, ordering sleeves and necks in clever ways. Well, I agree with you, and I advocate it all the time. But you know, what surprises me, that when I came to Dallas, I was told that it was the hotbed of the rebels against the new fashion. And I've seen more women in the streets of Dallas with longer skirts than I have even seen in New York. The gentleman in the balcony. My name is George Jeffers. I'm a student from Arlington, Texas. My question is directed to Adrian. Has anyone in American manufacturing, clothing manufacturing, ever approached you and tried to push the idea that you're designing clothes with added materials? Mr. Adrian, has anybody in the American designer ever approached you with the idea of pushing this by this idea by getting you to add more material to your no, as a, as a matter of fact, I was talking to one of the great, large manufacturers of woolens in New York just before I came here. And I was very curious to find out what the manufacturer felt about this fashion, whether they were losing money on it or making money or what it was. And they said that they were, manufacturers were very upset. They said that their materials were made to be worn on what we know now as the American look, and that this new bulging look made their materials impossible to be worked with because it made things so thick they couldn't sell them. And they, they felt they'd have to redo their whole rooms in order to cope with it. So I don't think that they want it. At least they didn't seem to seem that way to me. Thank you. Uh, all right, the uh, gentleman, the young gentleman there with the sweater. Yes? Well, I'm Bob Jensen from Woodrow Wilson High School, and I'd like to ask Miss Long a question. Are American women dictating fashion, or are fashions dictating to the American women? Oh, I think that we're, di we're dictating fashion. We have rejected a great deal on this. Mr. Adrian and Miss Bennett are constantly talking about the things that everyone dislikes, the very clumsy, the very fussy things. I don't care for them. Miss Benson doesn't care for them. 
I'm the American woman of rejecting them right and left, except the very extreme exhibitionistic type of people who always wear the wrong thing anyway. What? Uh, thank you. I'll write the uh, young lady in the balcony. Betty Gray, housewife. Don't you feel this is to uh, uh, Miss Benson? Don't you feel that the designers return to the most of the lush nineties and twenties is a subconscious yearning for the safety of those eras? Oh, boy. <laughs> no, I really don't think that that's their reason. I think that their reason is in order to make or try to make women buy new clothes because we've been doing with what we've had for so long. What? Uh, I'm Mrs. Sparks of Ordmore, Oklahoma. My question is to uh, Mr. Bennett or uh, Mr. Adrian. Adrian, please. <laughs> Now that there is so much controversy about the hymn links, don't you think this is a logical time for the American women to adopt their own daytime after five and even evening links that are most becoming to them? Well, I think we've said just about that. Yes, that's been covered. Please be careful to uh, ask new questions. All right, the lady on the aisle here. Yes. Go ahead, don't wait. Norma Ruth Harvey, and I'd like to ask Miss Dennison, when three out of four American women dislike the new look, then who has the authority to say they are here to stay? If they will dislike them, they won't wear them. That's all I can tell you. Nobody can force American women to wear anything they don't want. And don't think that magazines or fashion editors or designers are forcing American women to wear the new clothes. American women are choosing them themselves. And only from what I see and notice I can say that the new fashions are here. Thank you. Seems to be a difference of opinion on statistics as to how many people are wearing. The young lady who asked the question said three out of four women didn't want them, and Miss Benenson says they are taking them. Mr. Adrian says they're not. Miss Long says they are. So uh, it, you pay your money and you take your choice. But let's go on here with a question uh, down on the aisle. I'm just a confused male. Mrs. Joyce, the mother of three girls and three boys. My question is, ha, have... Two and The question is to Miss Miss Hawk. Well, there is no Miss Hawk. Miss Long. Miss Long. Long. Remember, we have a television, you see. You have to tell them. Uh, have any designers of today recognized the need of materials to clothe the children of Europe if so, how have you promoted, or how have they promoted the idea? I'm afraid I got that very difficult one before. Of course, it's like almost everything else in a complicated economy. If we could be sure that extra materials would go to Europe, I am sure that nine women out of ten wouldn't hesitate for the second to live in that course if necessary. But we can't be sure. We only know what we are being offered and what is apparently plentiful. Thank you. Now the lady on this aisle over here, the black cat. My name is Nan Paul. I'm a housewife from Fort Worth. I would like to ask Miss Benenson uh, for her suggestions on how the woman who is fair, fat, and 40 can acquire the new look. A little professional advice, gratis, uh, Miss Benenson. Well, put a belt on your clothes and pull in your waistline. Make your dress a little longer by letting out the hemline. Take out the bulky pads out of your shoulders. If you knew, need pads, put very tiny ones in. And I think by that you'll acquire a new look. Thank you. A gentleman over here on the aisle. I'm David Carnahan, and I go to Highland Park, and I want to address my question to Mr. Adrian. Why should we consider his American look the acme of fashion revolution? Well, that sounds like a dirty dig. I, uh, did, I, but I didn't know you did. No. <laughs> All right, Mr. Adrian, we'll see what we can get over here. This lady has a question for you. A little louder, please. We can't hear you. Mrs. Montgomery, housewife and secretary. Since it would permit the use of good garments, which we already possess, 
when to compromise a medium leg skirt be a wise solution. A compromise and what? When to compromise a medium leg skirt be a wise solution. Well, that's what the, this is all about. Well, I say that the compromise is in the middle of the calf. It shouldn't go any longer. That's somewhere between the knee and the ankle. <laughs> all right? The young lady here. Considering the present inflationary crisis and repeated appeals from national leaders to curtail buying, is it logical to induce women to buy a new wardrobe? I don't think that it's necessary to buy a new wardrobe. I, I would be terribly against that myself. But the fact still remains your clothes do wear out. When you need to replace them, why not get something that, that's new and sparkling and fun and uh, gay? I mean, clothes don't go out of fashion all of a sudden if they're good clothes. A good tailored suit is never out of fashion, I don't think. Thank you. I see my old friend Tim Healy down there in the audience. Tim, have you got a question for one of these speakers? I've got a very good question, Mr. Denny. Well, uh, I'd like me. to ask Miss Benenson, um, why do the best-dressed women in the world, the American women, have to take fashion designs from any other country? Well, they uh, do take fashion. Today, the best-dressed women, what you call, and I find that all the American women are very well-dressed. They look much better than in any other country. They don't adapt, and they don't take foreign fashion. They buy their clothes in America, and they have to choose some different designers, those that believe in big pads and short, narrow skirts, and in, they buy from those that believe in a natural look. I thank you, Miss Benenson. Now, while our speakers prepare their summaries of tonight's question, here's a special message of interest to you. Many of you are listening to town meeting for the first time tonight, and we want to extend you a very special welcome and hope you'll join us in future town meetings on the wide variety of subjects we discuss during the course of a year. And many of you will ask the question, how is town meeting supported? Like all radio, it's supported directly or indirectly by advertising. A few months ago, America's town meeting of the air switched to a plan of cooperative sponsorship which enables it to be sponsored locally in all of the 225 cities where it's heard over the affiliated stations of the American Broadcasting Company. Next week and all during October, we'll be welcoming new sponsors to the town hall family. Local sponsors who believe firmly in the town meeting way of dealing with controversial questions. While pressure groups seek to divide and weaken America, your town meeting asks to attain unity through understanding by presenting both sides in honest discussion in the highest American tradition. And now for the summaries of tonight's discussion, here is Mr. Denny. And now let's hear a final summary from Adrian. I don't think we will have any drastic changes in women's daytime fashions for years. There are plenty of exciting new things to do in fashion without pulling out the old 1922 bromide. The old-fashioned theory of dropping skirts to the ground one season and raising them to the knee the next is as dated as a horse and buggy. Today, women are too busy. There are too many working women and too many housewives to be bothered with hindering fashions. Women want to look new and stimulating, but they do not want to look eccentric or dowdy. We have in this country some of the best designers in the world. France, if she had them, would be proud of them. I beg these American designers to use their good creativeness and make our own fashions for American women today, and to be proud of their own ideas. Thank you, Adrian. Now, Mr. Benenson, a final word from you, please. I believe, Mr. Adrian, that your fight is much more against the magazines and the Paris influence than against the new fashions of today. Fashions are never static. If they are, they are no longer fashions. This is 1947 and not 1946. And nothing ages a woman more than the fashions of yesterday. I believe that the clothes of today have charm, grace, and femininity. And don't for a minute believe that anybody can bully the American woman, not even her husband. She's intelligent enough to choose for herself what she wants to wear. And I do hope, Mr. Adrian, that before long you will agree with us and you will start designing your magnificent clothes for the women of today. Thank you, Mr. Benenson, Adrian, Lois Long, and Constance Bennett. Our thanks also to Station WFAA and our town meeting host committee. Now, friends, you've heard both sides of this fashion question. What do you, the American people, think? I'm sure that our speakers and the industry will be glad to have your opinion. 
And if you'll sit down and write us and tell us just what you think, we'll see that our speakers and the other fashion authorities get this information directly. Remember, our address is Town Hall, New York, 18 New York. And if you want a copy of tonight's discussion, enclose 10 cents to cover the cost of printing and mailing. Next week, we move to Kansas City to discuss the most timely topic in the field of international affairs. On what basis can our differences with Russia be resolved? Our speakers will be A.A. A. Boy, Jr., former Assistant Secretary of State, and Senator Glenn H. Taylor, Democrat of Ohio. As special interrogators, we'll hear from Clarence Decker, President of the University of Kansas City, and Homer Rainey, President of Stevens College, Columbia, Missouri. So plan to be with us next week and every week at the sound of the choir's bell. From Dallas, Texas, Town Hall and the American Broadcasting Company and its affiliated stations have presented America's Town Meeting of the Air, winner of 33 national awards. Your announcer is Russ Hall. This is ABC, the American Broadcasting Company.